All right. So welcome everyone to today's Beginners Machine Learning Workshop. Um, so my name is Ali Parande, and in this workshop, we were going to be covering a big guide to semantic segmentation with conventional and neural networks. So this is the uh, one of our fourth workshops in the fifth workshop, actually, in the series of Comptive Vision workshops, where we're going to cover semantic segmentation. And then from there, in the future workshops, we're going to cover style transfer, uh, image processing, and uh, fundamentals of cloud computing. So um, we will be covering more workshops in Microsoft Reactor in person, where we're going to be doing uh, more gluing together different services on the cloud. And then from there onwards, um, we can go and uh, like you know cover in more advanced areas. All the previous workshop recordings are available on YouTube, as I mentioned. And this workshop, we're gonna what we're gonna be focusing today is gonna be mostly on semantic segmentation. So we're gonna cover what it is, what, how does it differ from object detection, classification, and all around uh, image working with images. And then we're going to review a bunch of popular architectures and why they exist. So why did people decide to make an architecture of a model like what it is now? Like what are the different neural network architectures that we're using at the moment to build AI models around semantic segmentation? And how are they different? And how did they come across? So that includes quite a lot of review of the different papers that have been recently published. Then, um, I, if, I, if you have some time, I will try to show you how to build your own semantic segmentation model from the repo that we have. Um, and then um, I can also then talk you more about how you can run your own semsec models on images and videos. So there have been lots of recent advancements in computer vision. Um, one of those areas beyond object detection that's very exciting is semsec. And what SEMSEC does is it has quite a lot of different applications. Uh, one of those applications are around um, image processing for um, like the uh, autonomous vehicles and self-driving cars. As you can see, the other one is for like, uh, but in, in medical applications, it can be used to like detect cancer or detect like app anomalies in X-ray scans. So this is quite hard to do on um like we trained eye even so this is where actually the computers excel in human performance in detecting uh the semantic segmentation models then uh, there is also aerial image processing that could be useful and a scene understanding so like in this example for uh like the car can see other cars and other objects in real time as it goes drives through the um, the road, like one of my friends was driving Tesla the other day, and like on the in the car, like you could see, you could detect like different objects as it was going around the pavement. So this is all becoming possible, and this is actually kind of like in real time, it's possible to do it with SEMSEC models. So to understand how um, images work, to understand how SEMSEC models work, what we did cover in the previous workshops is we started telling you more about the images are stored in computer using arrays. So think of an image as a stacked array of numbers. So in our convolutional neural network workshop, uh, we covered how different channels in an image represent different colors and um, the numbers in, in the pixels. So each cell in this grid represents a pixel and the numbers represent the pixel intensity of that specific color channel. And they combine together to create an image like a color image is three separate color channels of numbers stacked together and then the computer can basically figure out what color it needs to pre print on a screen for you so in order for you to see uh, an image. And then videos are just basically an array of images that played through Sorry, time, could you? that are played through time, that was Siri. And um, so that's it really, that's how images are stored in a computer and that's how complemented by computers. The numbers in the array and in the cells range from zero to 255, zero representing a black or a null value, and 255 is the maximum number that can go in a, in a cell, and that represents the maximum intensity value for that specific color channel. If it's a grayscale image, you only have one color channel, gray, so like if it's grayscale, so the intensities go from black to white, 
and grays in between. If you have a color picture, it's three separate color channels. So uh, you, any neural network you work with that is accepting normal pictures in, it will need three color channels and a height and width, which is the height and width of your image. Uh, you could have a fourth color channel that's called the alpha channel and that's more like opacity and like other things so we're not worried about that but like you, in more complex data sets like lidar scans or things like that you might have more color channels and when you pass these images through a neural network what happens in the neural network so this is like a live neural network that um if you go to the stanford website on their course website you can see a demo of it running live in a browser is that as you pass the image through the left from the beginning of the neural network all the way till the end, uh, the neural network learns the basic features like lines and circles and like edges in the beginning layers. And then as you go through the network and you go deep into the layers, it learns higher contextual information about the image. Like, a pet, like this is an ear, or like what this, this is an eye, like a car has a wheel. So it can, it can start to see, it can understand, start to understand patterns of how different small shapes can come together to create like bigger shapes and bigger patterns. And then based on those patterns, you can then understand uh, and classify objects in an image, or you can classify the images, whether it's a cat or a dog and so on. So this is a, cl a classic object classification, uh, a, a image classification task happening here. Uh, we pass an image from left to right, and then um, it, it learns the basic shapes like lines, edges, corners, in the early layers and it learns more higher contextual lay layers like wheels, ears, eyes, and so on in the last uh, last layers. So um, to give you another example in this, for example, deep neural network, as you can see the input image, when it goes through the network, it starts to see identify edges. And then when you combine these edges together, as you go through the network, you start to identify features and more complex patterns. And then we call this encoding. You encode the image into a network, and then the network then uses an encoding to figure out uh, to map the input to an output. So when you when you actually train a neural network to map an input to an output, you are in fact playing around with some knobs and dials on a box until the input is mapped to an output. So in the future, when you give it an input, it will know what kind of output it maps to. And you can make predictions based on that. So you can give it an image and you can predict to a good accuracy, whether it's looking at a dog, a cat, like any of the classes that you think yourself would be relevant in your application. But the thing is, deep neural networks, as we covered in our convolutional workshop, are not very good at um, any kind of image task or image uh, understanding task like on image classification, object detection, semantic segmentation, because deep neural networks lose the context of pixel positions. So an image is, a, is basically an array of pixels and this array of pixels, each pixel has a relationship with a pixel next to it or behind it or above it and so on. This relationship of pixels that are sitting inside an image it's very important data and an important pattern that when you try to use deep neural networks to understand, you're actually flattening the image in order to fit it through the network. And that flattening operation will cause that image to lose that pattern information of positioning of pixels. That's why uh, deep neural networks like DNNs like this one or multi-perceptual networks, although they may be good at classifying images that are very simple, like I don't know, like, MNIST data set or fashion MNIST, which we covered in our previous workshops, they may not be good for proper image classification tasks or image tasks in general, especially when they are bigger, like 400 by 400 pixel images of colored objects. So that's why uh, researchers started using something called convolutions. So, Convolutions, think of them as Instagram filters. So what you do is you take a, like basically a filter, you pass it around the image and you create a filtered image like this one. You say you convolve the image. 
So as you can see, uh, you you pass the filter across the input image and then you create an output image that is basically a convolution of your current image and that filter. Um, this is an example of like what a filter could look like. So uh, here, for example, you can pass an outline filter through an input image and you create some kind of output image that has the edges like heightened, right? And then passing these heightened images and stacking them together and passing them through the network, the network can then use these filtered images to figure out the patterns in the data. So using these, like this is normally in the early stages of the early layers of the convolutional neural network, the network starts to learn the patterns using by creating these filters. Um, but as you go down, deeper into the network, the network will then have more, it will then combine these patterns together to, uh, to have more understand the features, actual features of the patterns in your data. So this is a different way of thinking of neural networks. They start to use convolutions and that's why we call them convolutional neural networks. So each layer in the network is basically convoluting the image into creating more, in, more filtered images basically as you go through it. And um, that's just for one color channel, as you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, but with multiple color channels with colored images, the way it works is that like you have a field kernel or a kernel filter that basically slides across your image for each color channel. And then you add up all the numbers and you create your output channel like that. Right? Now, what a neural convolution neural network does is we have our, we can, we can basically set our own kernels and different kernels constructs different output images as you can see here. So as you like put any of these different, as you basically pass any of these filters through the network, sorry, uh, through the image. So as you slide across any of these different kernels through the image, you start to basically construct different output images. So you might across and uh, if you, basically slide a identity kernel, you might get the same image. But if you, for example, slide across any of these like kernels, we can call that like the one at the bottom is called the servo, for example, kernel. Uh, you, you start to construct more um, output images that are more useful for edge detection. So classic, classical computer vision applications might not use neural networks. They may just use a convolution like this one to basically get to the edge detection, uh, to detect edges in an image and start doing stuff based on that. But what a convolutional neural network does, imagine it that like you defined a bunch of filters that have no, that you don't define these numbers in the kernels yourself. The, the, the convolutional neural network itself learns to play with these numbers inside kernels until it maps the input image to the output that you're looking for. So if the output is like a bunch of classes, uh, it figures out the numbers to put into these kernels itself. So when we say a convolutional neural network is learning, what we mean by that is the, the convolutional neural network is figuring out the filters kernels that it needs to use in order to map the input to the output. So, in an architecture like this one, for example, we put the input image through the network and it constructs like 96 filtered images of 55 by 55. Uh, it performs a max pooling on it, then it does a bunch of more convolutions. And then as you go down and you get through the network, you start to get like a lot of more filtered images. So it becomes like deeper and deeper. And then at the end, you flatten the um, all the last layer of images and parameters into a deep uh, neural network, which is called the classifier. And then you can then use that to classify images, for example. So in this specific architecture, um, you're using, but basically you stack it together different convolutional operations in order to get to your uh, output image or output results that you're looking for. So kernels are like hyperparameters. So they're not hyperparameters. They are parameters that get tuned by the network. But what you define in your architecture, you define how many filters you've got. So you define the size of the filters and how many filters you've got. And then the, um, the, the network can then figure out uh, the numbers on these filters.
And one of the other operations that they normally do in neural in convolutional neural networks is called max pooling. Um, so think of max pooling is, as um, sliding some kind of kernel across the image um, in order to select the maximum number. So you, you slide across like a, a grid, so like a four by four grid across the image and you select, you select the top maximum number in that grid. And then you put that into your output image. So it's somehow you shrink the image, but you keep the signal. So this allows you to reduce the size and complexity of your image, but at the same time, keep most of the information that's within that image. So what this allows you to do is allows you to get rid of a lot of data and noise that you don't necessarily need in order to understand the patterns in your data. Um, think of it as like, we need, you know, when you increase the contrast in an image and that like the edges start looking sharper and everything looks like a bit uh, cleaner, what max pooling does is effectively that, but it also reduces the size of the image at the same time. So it gets rid of a lot of pixels that you don't need because those pixels are saying the same thing. And it only keeps the pixels that are like the most important pixels. And the way it does that, it slides across a kernel. And in this kernel, it just basically selects each as it slides across. Um, every four pixels outputs one pixel and it outputs the maximum number from that four pixel. So in here, one, five, three, two, the maximum number of these is five. So five goes in the thread cell level. Then we slide the red for uh, the grid of four by four across the image. And then we start filling the rest of the pixels up there. So that is what is called a max, uh, max pooling layer. Exactly. It takes the highest number in the matrix. Yeah, you're definitely correct. So normally in power in our typical CNN architectures, the ones that like researchers normally use is they use a lot of convolutional layers. And at the end of each convolutional layer, you basically drop a max pooling layer to just basically reduce the size of your image, but at the same time, keep all the signal, keep all the information. And the reason you do that is because the deeper your network becomes, um, if you have to pass all those pixels into the, into the network, it's just going to be very computationally expensive. So you use a max pooling layer to just basically capture uh, the essence of your filters as you pass the data through the network. And then when you do backdrop to train the network, the network just plays around with the filters. Uh, so with the parameters in the filters. So these are called your network parameters until it learns how to map your input to the output that you're looking for. And the output of your network is up to you. So, you know, the output layers or the classifier, um, so the flattened layers here, it's up to you how you play around with how you design, for example. So we normally call the early state, uh, we normally call the bit that has a lot of convolutional networks and convolutional layers in it. We call that P, a part of the network a feature extractor. And then we call the last bit, which is most normally uh, a flattened, dense, fully connected network. We call that a classifier because in this application, we use a convolutional neural network to classify images, for example. So this architecture you see here, which is Lenet 5, they use it to classify images into 1000 different categories using a softmax output function at the end. So you use, they're using softmax here so that they can, and then with cross entropy loss um, to basically categorize images into 1000 different categories. So as you go deeper into the network from left to right, uh, the number of your filtered images increases, but the size of your filtered images reduces. So the width and height of the filtered images reduces. So you go from uh, 227 by 227 heat width and height picture with three color channels to 55 by 55 picture heat width and height with 96 color channels or 96 filters here then to 27 by 27 um, color channels. And then here uh, we use a stride of two. So S here stands for stride. So how many, so when you slide the kernel across, how many pixels you skip per slide? Are you gonna go one by one? Or are you gonna skip a bunch of pixels when you slide across? Um, 
So you normally use a higher stride if you have a big uh, image that you don't need all of the uh, image to be convoluted. So the way max pooling layers work is if you don't provide, if you don't ask the, uh, for example, if you don't ask TensorFlow to uh, put a same sized image, normally the image gets reduced. Uh, so the width and height of the image get divided by two. So that's why here you go from 50, from 227 to 55 by 55, then 27 by 27 and so on. So the stride can reduce the size of the height and width. The max pooling layers can also reduce the size of height and width. Um, and as you convolute the number of filters, normally they increase the number of filters. So the numbers here, 96, 96, 256, 384, 384, these are the numbers that are called hyperparameters that you provide. How many filters do you, should I put in this network in this layer? How many filters should I put next in this network in this layer? And then, um, then the network figures out how to play around with those parameters in order to map the input image to the output. So Appbus, to answer your question around, is this image processing applicable by regular computers or it needs powerful computers and GPUs? So normally in order for you to do any proper real application from third vision, um, even if it's image classification, you probably need GPUs. So this is very, very expensive operation to do on a CPU because you're gonna have to pass in a lot of images and you're gonna have to create a lot of convolution filters convoluted images basically as you pass the image through the network and it's just very computationally expensive to do it with cpu because the cpu multiplies the matrices sequentially on gpu you can multiply the numbers of matrices in parallel so asynchronously basically and um, this allows you to then parallelize a lot of things that's why you use gpus uh, google has also produced an another more powerful um, processing unit called tensor processing unit. So that is, it's even way more parallelized than the GPU is. So it's even way more faster. So um, any questions on CNNs and how they architected? So in this specific CNN, um, they're not, um, they're, the reason that the network gets deeper and deeper as you go through the network is because the researchers found that this is one of the more efficient architectures to use. Um, just because you don't need all of those spatial relationships at the, at the end layers, but in the beginning layers, it's important to understand those spatial relationships. That's why at the beginning, the width and height is still big. And but as you go through the network, you can get rid of those width and height and you can just stack together lots of different filters. So imagine any of these filters is basically, you can figure out if you're looking at a camel, if you have more of these filtered images than if you don't have more of these filtered images. So that's why as you go through the network, you have way more filtered filters in your color channels compared to uh, the earlier layers. So the last, um, so we have another question from Yao Ming. What do the last three rectangles represent? So the last three rectangles represents a fully connected dense neural network. So what you've done here is you've taken the last layer, which is six by six by 256. So if I just multiply it, um, you get nine. So this is the number of parameters you have in the last layer and you flatten this. So you have 9,216 nodes now, no neurons, that you basically put them into a vector and then you connect it to another layer of vectors, but this one will have 4,000. And then you connect it to another 4,000 layered hidden network and uh, basically like a, uh, just a fully, uh, just a dense vector layer. And then you pass that to the last layer, which is a soft max output function that then classifies the output of this last layer to 1000 classes. So that, um, so basically that's what this last layer does. So the, the objective behind this last layer is to classify the encoding. So what you do from left to right is you're encoding the information in the image and the patterns in the image into this like really deep 250, 256 filtered images, six by six in size. So this last layer and the last layers represent the learned patterns. And then you can then basically 
attach a classifier on top to then use that encoding in whatever application you're interested in. Any other questions? All right, then um, one of the other things you might do as well, before you pass the images in, uh, you will normalize them. And by normalizing, I mean, do you remember this? Uh, here, the pixels are between zero and 256. So the range that goes into the pixel intensities range from zero to 256. Uh, when you normalize the image, and those numbers go from zero to 256 from two, zero to 56, it would go to zero to one or minus one to one. So this is called a normalization. So you normalize the pixel intensities in an image. And the whole reason you do that, um, there's no other reason. The whole reason you do this is because you will help the, the neural network to learn better, to learn faster and to converge faster when it learns. So here you can see the loss function of a neural network. And the loss function in relation to the bias and the parameter vectors. And they, if you, for example, um, the whole objective around training neural network is to reduce the loss function to the minimum. So play around with the parameters of the neural network until the output of the neural network has a loss or error that is like minimized. And um, when you train the neural network, you're, you're basically monitoring where your loss is and you want to basically reduce it all the way, it goes all the way down to minimum. When your images are not normalized, your loss function looks like the one on the left. But when your images are normalized, your loss function looks like a ball that you can easily navigate. The first one is like a um, Frisbee, or it could look like way more complicated and it makes it much harder to go down to the bottom of the ball or do gradient descent. But uh, when you normalize the image, it is, makes it easier to go down this rabbit hole or this ball basically and get to the minimum. Uh, to minimize your loss function, basically, to minimize your errors in your predictions. So this is basically a function of what your predictions could look, look like with and without normalization. So that's like another thing you would do when you pass your image through the neural network. So this, is, this was more like a primer of convolutional neural networks. Uh, before we get actually into the how now how can we do like this is i know how to do classification now how can i actually now do semantic segmentation with this so when it comes to semantic segmentation your problem becomes way more complicated than uh like it's one of the most complicated problems compared to image classification so what you saw here this whole neural network that you just saw here all it does is that it can basically look at an image and tell you it's a cat okay if you can then um, take that cat and draw a bounding box around it and say, in this image, the cat is here, you've got yourself a localization task. So you can localize the object in an image. So that's way a bit more complicated to do that, but you can do it with a convolutional neural network again, depending on how you play around with the output of your convolutional neural network. Then if you go a bit further and you make it more complicated, you can also detect lots of different objects and of different classes. So you can do a multi-class object detection. So the first one is just classification and localization. So a single class object detection is classification and localization. And multi-class object detection is basically standard object detection where you can detect a dog, cat, and, uh, and like different areas. All right. So um, then you have, uh, the last one, which is called instance segmentation, and this is basically a more advanced semantic segmentation where you will want to draw the boundaries of the actual object, right? So you don't just want to draw bounding boxes around the object, you want to actually like draw the boundaries around the object. So in the last one, what you're actually doing is you're taking a picture Right, so in the last one, which is you draw the boundaries around, you draw the edges of your object. What you're actually doing is you take a picture and you are classifying every single pixel in this image 
in a semantic segmentation, right? So um, you can think of this semantic segmentation mask on the right right hand side as basically an array of different vector, uh, array of different matrices, and each matrix is responsible for basically um, flipping the ones on parts on pixels of the image that has that specific object within it. So in here, you can see the person matrix has the has those pixels flipped to one where the person stands. Then the purse image has flipped those pixels where the person stands, uh, has the purse. Then the plants, then the site work, then the building structures, and you basically do a multi-class segmentation of your image in this way. All right. And we have different types of segmentation. So this one that you see here is called instance segmentation, right? But we actually have three types of segmentation. We have instance segmentation, where you take one object and figure out how to identify it in an image. You, you teach a neural network to identify that specific object in an image, and then you can then identify different instances of that object um, all around the image, like this one, for example, with the cars. Um, you give it an image and you can see all the cars or pedestrians. And each one is different, right? So in a, in a normal computer vision, self-driving car application, every car that you drive with, drive around, every car that it sees is a separate object. Even though the cars are the same, so you're like a car is a car, um, the class is the same, but like because you're doing instance segmentation, each car is an instance. So each car gets a separate ID identifier. In semantic segmentation, you don't care about the instances. You just basically paint, like imagine you get a grayscale image and you just paint all the cars the same color, all the buildings the same color, the site work the same color, the persons, all the persons the same color. So that's called a semantic segmentation. If you combine both, then you have something called a panoptic segmentation. So that's what you do in self-driving cars. It's where each object in your view that could be an obstruction, they, be, they become an instance and then the environment around you, they are semantically segmented, or we call this scene understanding. Your computer can understand the scene around it. So you can see where the sidewalk is, it can see where the vegetation is, it can see where the sky is, but at the same time in the scene, it can see like the objects, like the person in front of it, the car that's coming to crash into you, the pedestrians walking around, the bicycle is just like coming in front of you, all of those things. So in a self-driving car application, you're most likely to see a panoptic segmentation. And each one is different, like uh, neural network architecture you need to do for the last few layers of your architecture. Any questions before we go to the actual architectures themselves? So this, this is where we're going to the meat of the workshop. All right, so let's start with the first one. So when we want to do semantic segmentation using a normal convolutional neural network, um, what is important in semantic segmentation is being able to understand what we're looking at in the picture, but at the same time that we localize that object in the image, we want to understand the full context around. It. Like we want to understand where the object is and um, identify the whole part of the object as one item instead of like not being able to see the different parts of it. So um, one of the ways we could do it is we just can take a normal convolutional neural network, but instead of basically creating lots of, um, doing a, a lot of max pooling layers to get rid of the unnecessary pixels or like to get rid of more, a lot of pixels. We don't get rid of any pixels because we need the spatial information in the image. We need the spatial context and then just basically do a lot of convolutions on top and create a lot of filters and then just basically fine tune these filters. So your prediction lasts and then at the end you do a, something called the pixel wise softmax activation layer 
Uh, we will go into what it is in the in later. But basically, what it does is that your prediction will be an uh, will be a matrix of numbers, where in this matrix you will have uh, basically the the matrix will be the same dimension as your current picture. So your picture is going to be a height multiply width multiply three color channels, and your predictions will be height multiply width. And then in this grid, in, in this matrix of numbers, you will have basically zero, one, two, three, four, five. So you will have a classification number for each pixel. So this is like the most basic semantic segmentation architecture. But at the same time, because it's the most basic, it's also the most computationally expensive and the least efficient just because you're not doing any kind of encoding as such. Like you're not getting rid of any data. You're literally just passing the whole image through the network and like asking the network to learn everything, all the, all the information, all the spatial information and all the patterns, learn all of it, right? And a lot of that is noise. Like you don't need to learn like a lot of information about like the trees in the background of like all sorts of different shapes they are. Uh, when you pass the image through the network with like, not resizing it and stuff like it learns all of those noise as well right so what um the researchers did instead is they looked at another architecture called alexnet so alexnet is a you know typical cnn architecture that you use to basically classify cats and like, I don't know, classify images. And basically what it does is that it takes an image and creates lots of like 96 filters in the beginning, then 256 convolutional filters, 384, 384, 256. Then it basically a classifier on the top, 4096, 4096, and then 1000 uh, classification layers at the end. Uh, and then you basically then use it to figure out what you're looking at. So AlexNet, classifies images into 100 different classes. So it's a typical convolutional neural network architecture used for classification. But what they did is they repurposed it so that it works on image segmentation tasks. So when you go from a big image all the way to the very deep, like last layer, um, this, this process is called encoding. You encode the image into a layer that basically has learned all of the information in that image. And when you visualize that layer, it looks like a heat map like this one. So when you visualize it back up into an image, you get some kind of heat map that like shows where kind of like the cat is. So if it's learned what the tabby cat looks like, it like it, it can, you can see in like pixelated format where the uh, Alex, where, where that image is. So this kind of architecture, what it does is that it, encodes the, the patterns in an image into a very deep neural network layer. And then it then tries to decode it all, all the way back up into the full-sized image again. So it tries to get rid of the information, but at the same time, it tries to then upsample the deep encoded information. Think of it as like when you save a file into disk and then you want to read it back into your video player and watch a video. You first download it from the internet, it's then, encoded into your hard disk. And then when you try to watch it, your computer then decodes that MP4 file into uh, like a series of videos that you can then watch. It's the same kind of process. You, your neural network encodes the patterns in an image, like it encodes the semantic segmentation patterns. Uh, like for example, where the pixels are, like the spatial information and the localized information uh, in an image and it learns the patterns. And then when you try to decode it, uh, when you try to then perform segmentation on top, you have to decode it back up into the actual full-sized image, as you can see here. And you use a pixel-wise layer at the end for doing the performing the prediction. And um, in order to train this network, all you have to do is do a normal backdrop. Kind of, you have a loss function that you try to optimize. And then once you optimize that loss function and you minimize it, then you have a trained neural network. So before I go forward, there are two more questions I will answer. So Appos is asking, is there any way to automate parameter tuning? 
So parameter tuning, depending on what parameter you are tuning, if it's just a normal neural network parameter, it gets tuned during the training process. If it's a hyperparameter, there are different processes for that. You can do a grid search, you can do some kind of like different type of parameter search, but there are also cloud tools that are exist now. It's called AutoML, uh, which is their whole job is to just play, try to automate this whole hyperparameter searching for you by parallelizing the development of lots of different models in parallel, or, and then figuring out which one learned the best, or basically doing um, like some kind of like grid search or parameter search and figuring out what type of parameters to use. So in, in effect, it's some kind of like neural network that has learned how to optimize the training process of other neural networks. So it's like a bit meta, but um, yes, there are ways to do that. If you Google um, AutoML, uh, you would be able to see like some of these applications with AWS, Azure, or GCP. And then Ahmed says, uh, do we need ground truth data for training? Uh, so there are public data sets available for this, but if it's your own data set uh, and you're trying to train a model on that, then yes, you will need to sit down and you will need to label a lot of images like 10,000, 50,000 and so uh, in terms of like semantically segment the objects in them. So uh, to show you what I mean by that. So if you go to uh, SEMSEC labeling, if you just Google that, um, semantic segmentation, you will need to use some kind of segmentation software like this one, and you will need to take your picture and semantically segment um, your whole image yourself. And you have to do it for like a lot of different images. And then, then you can pass this to your neural network. And normally the output of these softwares is the image plus some kind of JSON or some kind of data structure that then you can pass through Python and then you can pass that with the neural network. Um, data when you pass it to the network. So, in a way, yeah, you can uh, you can try you can take a convolution neural network that has learned to detect cats, for example, Jenny, uh, and in a way perform transfer learning on top to make it more um, optimized for the task of predicting um, like individual pixels. But the thing is the neural network that has learned to classify cats has been learned, has learned to identify patterns and like shapes in a cat uh, image, but not necessarily the pixels, each pixel of the cat. So um, with a semantic segmentation model, um, the neural network needs not to just learn where the cat is and like the edges of the shapes of the body of the cat, but it needs to understand that like this specific pixel belongs to the cat. Like for example, this cat has white fur, it has black fur, at, uh, it has um, white fur at the leg, white fur at the chest. And then it, it, um, in this image, there is flashlight in its eyes. Then it has like different color for his head. So your neural network needs to learn that like this cat has like all of these different patterns in it uh, in the global context when you look at it but it also needs to learn um, the shape of the cat's ears in order to be able to classify that object and that the pixels in this object into the correct classes. So that's why it's a bit more of a more difficult problem compared to a normal uh, image classification task. But if you have already taken a neural network that has learned image classification like VGG16, for example, which has learned, it's been pre-trained on, uh, image classification tasks, you can then fine tune it. Um, you may have to fine tune the feature extractor part, which is the neural network parts, the convolution neural network parts, in order for it to also be able to, in order to make it performant on SEMSEC applications. I hope that answered the question. So, um, so yeah, so basically when you use a fully connected neural network, uh, convolutional neural network, we call them FCNs. 
um, you're using an encoder decoder architecture. So you're downsampling an image into, and you encode it into like just the patterns that is available in that image in the network. So the network learns just the patterns. And then when you want to then uh, classify each pixel into the right class, you then encode it all the way back up or you upsample, you encode that decoded information using upsampling to the same resolution as your existing image. But this time you try to predict what pixels those classes belong to. So you kind of like upsample, you downsampling and then you upsampling because your it's actually the deep uh, layers in the network, the deep convolutional layers that has like a lot of filters in, um, in, in the middle layers that has learned most of the patterns. So you need to kind of like decode it back up into the actual full sized image. And normally use some kind of like upsampling interpolation techniques because you're trying to go from one pixel to like nine pixels. So you imagine a one, pic, one by one pixel grid or a nine by nine pixel grid. With a one to one pixel grid, you're trying to go all the way up to nine by nine pixel grid. The nine by nine pixel grid, for example, you're trying to go up to like 200 by 200 pixel grid. And like you have a lot of new pixels that you have to try to fill and you have to figure out how to fill those pixels in a way that makes sense from those nine pixels data point you have. So you're kind of like, you're trying to create new data points from by inferring on your existing data points. So we have different upsampling methods that do this. Um, some of them are traditional ones on the left-hand side are called nearest neighbor, where if you're trying to take a two by two pixel grid into a four by four pixel grid, you basically just look at the nearest neighbor in that area. And then uh, you just basically make everything the same. Uh, you have a bed of nails, which basically um, just takes one um, number from the input pixel grid and then the rest of the pixel grid numbers are become zero. So they become black and you just basically create a bigger image like that. And then you have some kind of max pooling, max on pooling method, which basically uh, when you do the max pooling, you remember where, how your actual image got max pooled, like which positions you took, which numbers. And then at this, and then when you do on max pooling, you basically take um, the information in the input layer and then you put it where the actual um, maximum pixel values were before. So you remember the position of the numbers that you took the numbers from when you did on down sample and then you, you put the up sample numbers in the same positions and then everything else becomes zero. So everything else is more like noise. Um, so the, that's why you use a lot of zeros when you up sample, just because when you up sample, those, those pixels don't have much information anyway. That's why you got rid of them when you did down sampling. So when you up sample, you just put zero in those pixels again. So this is where I say the spatial contextual information is very important because it's where you put your pixels that matters when you do up sample as well. So it doesn't just matter what numbers go where, like what numbers you need to pick, but it's also important which, where should you put those numbers in the pixel grid in order for your upsampled image to make sense when you try to decode uh, an information. So think of this two by two grid as like your encoded patterned image. So this encoded two by two grid is literally like your, like if you try to, if you try to like squeeze your image down into its like uh, most condensed in a pattern rich format is this two by two grid with those numbers in it. And then when you try to squeeze it back up into an actual image that you make sense, then you have to use up sampling methods like this one. And then there is a more advanced up sampling method. It's called transposed convolutions. And then you can use these transposed convolutions. Think of them as like normal convolutional layers that have parameters in them that get to that the neural network can learn those parameters and play around with them. And then these transposed convolutions, what they do is they slide across a filter through the, um, from the, on the input, and then it generates, so the input here is basically the, the green pixel grid, and it generates the uh, dashed output pixel grid um, by just basically combine, uh, by convoluting a filter across it. So it's more like a, um, it's more like a convoluting it the other way around. 
So when you take a convolutional layer and you just make it an, and make it an opposite convolutional layer or transposed convolutional layer, instead of going from a pixel image, you're convoluting it down, you convolute it back up. Uh, so this is called a transposed convolutional layer. And the only problem with this is that when you slide across the filter, um, some pixels will get a lot more attention than the others. And what you end up happening is you end up creating pixelated upsampled images. So that's the only problem with this is even though like your network can learn it and optimize the upsampling, you might end up with upsampled images that are pixelated just because as you slide across the filtered image and you upsample or like you create a bigger image from, you create a bigger convoluted image from your input image, you still have uh, some information on some pixel area, the areas accumulating in a more pixelated format. So um, that's basically what happens with um, upsampling. And for example, what you will want to do with these neural networks is you want to go from a picture from left to right. Um, but the problem with this upsampling is it, they struggle to, so even though if you do all of that, if you put this architecture together and figure out your upsampling, that's the correct one. Uh, you end up with pictures that are kind of like rows resolution, semantically segmented images like this one. So you have the cyclist. Um, the ground truth looks like that, but your predicted segmentation is kind of like all a blobby. The reason for that is because you've lost localization. So it's a challenge between finding the global, uh, between finding the global context and localization. So localization is about all about fine grained details and like where that exact bicycle bike is. Globalization is about figuring out which parts of the whole image belongs to the bicycle and which parts of the whole image belongs to the person. So it's a kind of like a trade-off between these two when you're trying to um, put together an architecture for a neural network. And one of the ways for researchers to tackle this information issue is instead of like, um, instead of uh, keeping the input images the same size, so instead of like using the same size convolutional layers, they connect their previous layers to the future layers down the road. And we call this skip connections. So basically what they do is they take a bunch of layers in the beginning and they just basically drive a highway from them. They connect them straight without directly to the later layers using something called a skip connection. And they stack basically some convolution layers from the beginning and then they stack it on the last la later layers with the same shape and size. Um, and what this allows them to do is basically you push the signal from the early stage, we push the global context from the early layers all the way to the future layers, all to the, through the deeper layers basically. And this way is one way to boost the signal, boost, boost the pattern through the network. So to give you an example in this one, if your network has like a lot of like noise uh, without the skip connections, when you add the skip connections, which looks like this, you're literally just passing the input, you're skipping a bunch of layers and you pass the input through the, to, through the last layer, it allows you to pass the signal and keep get rid of the noise at the same time. Um, so this is what the um, researchers did with this neural network architecture is that they figured out if they add skip connections to the neural network architecture, they can basically help with localization. They can uh, keep the global context, but at the same time, pass the signal through for the spatial context, basically, around the localization of the objects, pass them through so that their output layers also have the understanding they can see the detail as well. Because as you go through the network, the detail kind of could get lost. Their spatial, their spatial context of like the little details are about the handle of the bike and things like that. So they, they managed to reduce, increase their resolution of the semantic segmentation images doing, by doing this. And after they found this out, 
uh, one of the researchers came up with an architecture called the unit architecture, which is more like a symmetrical architecture where every input convolutional layer is directly connected to the every in every convolutional layer in the in, in the encoder part of the architecture is directly skipped mapped to the uh, decoder convolutional layer. So as you go down into the network, you're also connected to the opposite decoder layer that's on the that sits on the opposite side. So you go down the network, you encode the information, and then you, when you go back up in the network and you upsample, you also bring forward the information from the previous layers. So that's why it's called a U-net architecture because it looks like a U. And uh, using this, then you can actually like um, train the network in a very more efficient way because you're actually pushing the signal in each layer to the corresponding decoder layers. And this boosts your signal quite a lot in a symmetrical format that allows you to actually do quite really good semantic segmentation models, especially if you focus your loss function on the edges of the objects. So if you penalize or not pen or reward the network on learning the edges of the objects, your, um, your neural network is gonna be very more sensitive on figuring out where the edges of the objects are. Any questions on unit architectures? All right. Um, so what I'm gonna do is... All right, so we talked about unit architectures and why they're very interesting and very important just because you're passing the signal from the early layers, the spatial context. So where the pixels are in relation to each other and like what the actual image is and when it's like in an actual resolution, for like a high resolution format and you're passing that information down to the deeper layers from the decoder, in, from the encoder to the decoder. And like they map in the, um, each corresponding decoder layer is mapped to the corresponding encoder layer. Um, and the encoders are passing the information to the decoder. So it's more like they have more Lego puzzle pieces to work with. So this allows the network to learn quite a lot and to perform way much better in semantic segmentation tasks. But there is even more that they, they could have been done. Uh, so researchers figured out um, if they start using more interesting layers, they can actually improve this unit architecture performance. So they came up with two different um, set of layers. So we call them a block. A block is basically a combination of layers combined together to perform a specific function or to create a specific uh, super layer, I would say. So think of them as a super layer that, that, are, that are basically made of a bunch of uh, more classical layers. So classical layers would be like convolutional layers, batch norm layers, ReLU activation functions, and so on. So we have a residual block, which is basically um, you take your input and you pass it through a convolution. You then batch normalize the output of that. You pass that through a ReLU activation function. Then you pass the output again through a convolution layer and then another batch norm layer. And then from the input as well, you add a skip connection to the output of that batch norm layer before you pass it through the final ReLU. So this architecture, this like residual block architecture is like, um, it's very good at like identifying the patterns at the same time, passing the signal and the context that could have not been captured in that pattern ca pattern catching part to the to the last layer. So like it combines everything together well. And then if you take a bunch of these residual blocks, um, well, not necessarily combine them, but like if you take the idea from here and um, you basically put together a bunch of layers, like let's say this could be residual layers or it could be like normal convolutional layers in the dense block. So if you look at the dense block now, dense block, it's very interesting and it's called dense because it looks like a, a fully connected neural network. Every layer, it's connected to the next layer and then layers after that. So uh, the input is connected to the next 
output of the layer and then the output is connected to the next output, the output is connected to the next output and at the same time, the layers are also all connected to the last output. So this is called a dense block. And it's literally like boosting the signal from the input all the way through to all the layers. So there's like boosting the signal, like interleaving the signal and the patterns through the network. And because it has so many skip connections, it's like boosts the signal really hard within the block. So not only you're passing the signal from the decoder to the encoder, from the encoder to the decoder using the unit architecture in an advanced unit, you're also doing, you're also passing the signal through the blocks as well. So as you could, you go through the network, as you do a forward prop through the network, um, the green block here is a dense block in this network. So as you do your normal convolutions and you go through the network, you also have a bunch of dense blocks um, in the decoder and encoder. And in the decoder and in, in the encoder layer, not only you're passing the input date, your input through, you're skip, doing a lot of skip connections between the layers as you go down, uh, you're also passing the output of each dense block to the, in, to the decoder at the same time, right? And this allows the network to basically never lose the context from the input image. So the input image is like a large image. Um, and when you're doing this skip connection and you're basically passing a lot of the input contextual information, uh, to the idea of basically giving the output that input contextual information, you're not losing that context anymore. So your neural network can localize the objects very, very well. So you can localize all the pixels really well because you're not losing that pixel resolution. That pixel level resolution that you need for fine grained segmentation, you're not losing it when you do a lot of skip connections like this. And if you notice, the, when you go up in the decoder layer, you don't have the same skip connections between the outputs and the, the inputs of the dense block and the outputs of the dense block. So when you go down, you have, in, you have skip connections between the input of the dense block and the output of the dense block. But when you go up, you don't have the skip connection between the input of the dense block and output of the dense block. The main reason for that is because it's computationally too expensive to do it. That's the main reason. And uh, the researchers figure it out that like, it's not very efficient. It doesn't do much when you add the, um, when you go from the decoder layer and you try to, when you go from the encoded layer. So the, the encoded layer is this dense block at the bottom. So the bottom is like bottom of the C and everything is encoded. So when you go back up to the surface level and you're trying to go from a really like small condensed encoded image information to your full resolution image. Um, it doesn't make sense to basically pass the input signal all the way back up because there's not much input signal to pass, but also it's just a lot of noise you, you will create that it's just lots of computationally expensive. So that's why you just pass the signal from the decoder to the from the encoder to the decoder across even like a normal unit architecture, but at the same time, you are doing a lot of skip connections from the inputs to the outputs of each dense block. And even in the dense block as well, you're doing a lot of skip connections. So this is more like an advanced unit and this, this has achieved state-of-the-art performance, just using the same ideas that we've learned just now. After this, um, researchers came up with more architectures as well. So there is another architecture that's very interesting. It's called a pyramid scene parsing network. So this one, instead of using skip connections, what they've done instead is as you do your normal CNN convolutional layers, um, you do something called a pyramid pooling. So what pyramid pooling does is, is that like, when you do your normal pooling and you do your normal convolution, you use different kernel sizes. So you first use a small kernel size and you scan the image at pixel level. Then you increase your kernel size a bit bigger and you scan the image again. Then you increase the kernel size even bigger and you scan the image again. And you just do that on the biggest scan that you can do, like the biggest kernel size that you can. And what this, what you're doing here is in the first scan, you're looking at all the details in the image, like as if someone is going through the image with like a magnifying glass and you're figuring out all the details. Then you like zoom out a bit and you start to learn a bit of a bigger picture view of the image. Then you zoom out and like you start to try to understand the fuller context. This is what basically what the net network is learning in this pyramid pooling module. And 
when it does this kind of convolutions on this at this image on these different resolutions and different kernel sizes, it then basically make an up, do an up sampling layer at the end where it takes all of these outputs of this different um, pooling module. So this pooling module creates different outputs at different resolutions. It basically up samples them to the same resolution so that it can concat concatenate them to the same CNN output. So you also have a skip connection as well from the first input all the way to the last output with a complete disconcatenation. So you have your feature map, which has a lot of deep convolution. It has a lot of convolution neural networks in it. So think of it as a, your standard feature extractor that you can take from VGG16, for example. And then you add this pyramid pooling on top. And then this pyramid pooling, what it allows you to do is it allows you to capture the resolution. Uh, it, it allows you to basically pass the fine grained details about the image through the network, but at the same time, it allows the network to classify in detail every pixel of the image, but at the same time, it understands the global context of the image. So when it performs semantic segmentation, it understands that these different pixels with different shades and colors, they all belong to the building. These pixels with all the different shades and colors belong to the pavement. These pixels are people. These pixels are like signs and signage and so on. So in order for you to create a really clean semantic segmentation picture at the end, you need to understand both the global context and the local context. So the local context is all these fine grained details and the global context is basically these shades of different pixels that are belong in this area, they belong to the same object. And are of all, all, they all of the same pattern. So you use the pyramid parsing, pyramid scene parsing network to do this. And this specific architecture is really useful for like something called a scene parsing. So when you do a semantic segmentation, so this is a standard semantic segmentation where you take a picture and you literally classify every pixel in it such that your final picture, you have a, basically a colorful image and each color represent each color represents an object in the image. So if you see a comparison that they've done uh, in this paper, uh, you can see that like, for example, I think the best example here would be the, uh, the the building. So on the image at the bottom left corner in the middle row, you can see that the ground truth is this building being all gray, but because the fully connected neural network, fully connected convolutional network, uh, didn't have the skip connections necessary and didn't have this uh, pyramid pooling module, it, it thought that the middle pixels in the building belonged to, um, belonged to the rest of the buildings but not the specific building in the middle, not to, not to the skyscraper. So it misclassified a bunch of the pixels of the skyscraper as buildings classification instead. But because the PSP net or the pyramid scene parsing network understood the global context, which is, oh, there is a skyscraper here. Um, let me figure out where the edges and boundaries of the skyscraper is. And then let me classify all the pixels within it as the same class. Um, the fully connected neural network didn't see it that way. So that's why it made mistakes in classifying all the pixels on the skyscraper to that specific class. But in a PSP net, it classified it perfectly like the same as ground truth. So it has other examples as well. So for example, in the uh, image of the bed, the pillows, um, in the ground truth, there is a pillow. It's the sky blue. The fully connected network didn't even see the below. It didn't even recognize it because it did it, it lost the context. So when you look at the image, like imagine looking at the image, like so closing your eye that you don't even see the pillar from the bed. So that's what happened with the fully connected uh, convolution neural network. It just didn't see the pillow is a separate item from the bed. But because the PSP net understood the global context, understood, oh, there's a bed here, there is a pillow. Hmm, I might remember that when I do my classification. And then when it went into like the detail and figuring out the local like edges of the objects, it managed to like draw the pillow really nicely and then figure out that all the pixels within this boundary is belongs to the pillow and classify that as a separate object. So this is what happened here. And this is another architecture that achieved good results when it comes to semantic segmentation.
So this is mostly useful for semantic segmentation, not instant segmentation, but you can adjust it to input perform instant segmentation. So we have a question from Yao Ming on this slide. So uh, he asks in here, we have a layer called a batch normalization layer. What is it and what's the purpose of it? So a batch normalization layer is basically a layer that you add on top of other layers. And its whole um, objective is to normalize the output of a layer in relation to what's inside that batch of data that's passing through the network. So um, each batch normalization layer, it has an input and it has an output. It takes the input. So the input normally in a convolutional network, the input is a bunch of images, a bunch of convoluted images. So think of them as like a stack of numbers and it normalizes the stack of numbers and all of these numbers are normalized in relation with each other. So the statistics, the standard deviation, the mean and average of these numbers are compared against each other when it tries to normalize this, all of these numbers within this input data that goes through them. The whole purpose behind batch normalization is to make the network converge faster and make the process of identifying patterns much faster. That's it. So the batch normalization layer helps with uh, making sure that the signal is improved and the signal is learned faster. It helps with fast, faster learning of the network. So that's why you add batch normalization layers after each convolution, just to make sure that the output of your convolution is normalized. And it's called batch normalization because you pass the input to the layers as batches. So when you actually code these neural network architectures in TensorFlow, you don't pass images one by one, you pass the images through the network in batches. When you train the network and when you make inferences. So when you pass an image through the network as a feed forward pass to make inferences on top, you are actually passing these images as a, you're passing the images as a batch of images. And then you make inferences on a batch of these images. And batch normalization layer basically performs this batch normalization operation. So it performs the normalization across the whole batch based on what's inside this batch of data. And each batch of data could be different. So um, whatever you get in this batch normalization layer in one batch of images might be different based on what's inside that batch. So a batch of, a batch of images could be just a bunch of images of cats. So the batch normalization output would be different if the batch of another set of images could be a bad, like a bunch of dogs. So a bunch of pictures of dogs would be batch normalized differently compared to a batch normalized uh, to a batch of different pictures of cats. So you normalize your images based on what's in the batch. That's why it's called batch normalization. And the whole purpose is just to improve the, uh, improve the uh, convergence of the network. All right, so the next architecture, um, that's actually the one that I wanted to show you today as well. If you wanna go play around with the code, it's called DeepLab. So this is uh, Google's architecture. That's actually one of the latest architectures and most advanced architectures when it comes to, uh, when it comes to semantic segmentation models. The whole idea behind this architecture is um, the invention of a convolutional operation called atrus convolution or dilated convolutions. And as you can see here, what this convolution does is it takes one pixel input of the input image, which is the input, the green input image, and it tries to then dilate, dilate that pixel into three other pixels. But because of the way it's doing it, um, it basically uh, keeps all the information the same. And it basically kind of like interpolates that three by three grid pixel into that like massive grid that you see at the bottom. So you don't get that same pixelation effect as you would get with the other images. So when you go from your small encoded image to your bigger image, um, a bigger decoded image, this atrus convolution 
um, or the dilated convolution allows you to then um, basically make a op better upsampling operation. So if you see here, for example, um, the image at the bottom, when you do a down sampling and then you do a convolution and you do a normal up sampling, uh, you get this image that is a bit like mostly green, some like patterns in there. But when you use an actress convolution from that image to the end, um, you get like all your encoded images up sampled at a very good, like uh, high resolution resolution basically. So like every, uh, the detail get up sampled quite really nicely this way, just because you're actually like spreading across the information into a bigger set of pixels uh, in a much, much better way. So it's a very like smart way to like up sample your encoded filter images into like bigger resolution images. And when you take and add these uh, actress convolutional layers from your encoder to your decoder, then you can actually make a very good, uh, interesting architecture where you keep, uh, when you both understand the local um, resolution, the, the, the local like contextual information as well as the global contextual information. So this is like a, a deep lab encoder decoder operation that uh, basically takes an input image and then uses actress convolutions to uh, pass them down and perform the prediction on top. Any questions on this specific operation? On the specific deep lab architecture? So again, you have your similar encoder decoder and um, yeah, you use the specific layers to make your off sampling operation much more efficient. And the good thing about these uh, convolution layers is that they, they can keep their contextual information both at a localized level and a global level. So you don't lose any information when you off sample. The last architecture that we wanted to look at is called ParseNet. Um, and basically what ParseNet does is um, when you have your feature map or your encoded set of convolutional layers, uh, all you do is you perform your pooling for performing for basically grabbing that into a global feature. And at the same time, you perform, a, so you have a feature map and you have your global feature layer and then you perform an L2 normalization on both of them to basically um, normalize those layers. And then you perform an unpooling operation, which then up samples those layers. And then you basically combine them together. And then you can then use that layer in order to perform your uh, semantic segmentation. So this is just like a different, um, architecture and a different type of operation to help you with performing uh, like your semantic segmentation model. So it performed much better than the fully connected uh, neural network, sorry, fully connected convolutional neural network, just because of the way of like how you're taking your feature map and you are both extracting the local feature signals as well as the global feature signals. And when you do performing the normalization on top, then yeah, you're helping with the convergence of the network. So it's just all about like skip connections. It's all about like you performing the op sampling correctly and making sure that like you're not losing the localization as well as the global features, global context when you're performing your um, convolutions as you go down the network. So, I told you like when I will come back to the um, this bit. So when I was talking about this pixel wise prediction, um, when you do a pixel wise prediction, um, how would you then go about penalizing your network if your network make, makes a mistake in its predictions? So your traditional like 
I don't know, soft max cross entropy, like classification and stuff is kind of like not going to make sense to use it here. You will need um, to think about how you're going to uh, calculate your loss and how you're going to like actually improve your neural network by training it based on set, some set of loss functions. So in semantic segmentation, you will come across a couple of them. The most important one is called a pixel wise soft max with cross entropy loss. Uh, so this loss basically is a soft max. So use soft max because you're doing some kind of classification. So soft max and cross entropy you use these loss functions when it comes to classification. And cross entropy is when you use it when you have a lot of different classes. So when you're doing multi-class classification problems, you use softmax cross entropy. And here it's called pixel wise. It's because you're taking a vector of pixels in a set of filtered images, and you're trying to classify, um, you're trying to classify for that selected pixel in that pixel uh, set of color uh, channels, what this uh, pixel belongs to. Like, does it belong to this class or that class or that class and so on? So do you remember we had this um, pixel grid for each of these classes? So in here, what you are trying to do is you're trying to map your ground truth to this prediction pixel grid. So each class gets its own pixel grid. And then in here, you're going to use a pixel wise soft max and each of these pixel grids represent one of these pixel grids here. And you just basically overlap them and then you figure out uh, the scoring based on that. So uh, you have some kind of prediction for the selected pixel in each of these um, pixel classes. So each of these grids represents a class. So this could be a person, this could be a car, this could be a cat and so on. And then for that specific pixel in your picture, so the width and the height represent the size of your ex the image that you are basically predicting on. Um, in that specific resolution of that image that you're making a prediction on that specific pixel, in this grid, maybe this represents a person, you're 2% sure that this is a person pixel. In this specific grid, it represents a car. You're 1% sure that this is, a, this is gonna be a pixel related to a car. In this one, maybe it's a building. In this specific pixel grid, uh, which is for buildings, you 83% sure that this belongs to a building and, and so on. And this is your prediction of your model. And then you have the same for your, um, you have the same pic, uh, basically pixel grids, a set of pixel grids for uh, your ground truth. So this is, for example, the, the one on the right-hand side, your ground truth is something that your labeling software outputs. So when you go to your labeling software and you label all your images and you tell it, this is a building, this is a cat, this is a dog, the right image is what that software produces for you. And then the left image is what your neural network produces. And then your pixel Y softmax cross entropy function basically makes sure that it can, it compares the pixels from the left and then compares the pixels on the right in a pixel wise format, and then gives you a number. And then the scoring is um, basically repeated over all pixels and averaged together. And that becomes your number for that specific prediction. And then basically when you improve the loss function on this, then you improve your neural network. So if you try to minimize the loss that this formula gives you for all of the pixels for across all of the classes, when you do this uh, pixel by pixel comparison, uh, using that uh, cross entropy softmax loss function, then you can actually then improve your neural network. Does that make sense? So when you do a backprop, you use this to perform the backprop. So when you're backpropping, you kind of keep referring back to this number and try to reduce the number. And the way you calculate this number is you basically, uh, you compare each pixel in each of these channels in each of these label channels uh, for each class to your ground truth. Another loss that you could use is called a focal loss. So this is another method um, that some of the papers provided. 
This one is more about adapting this pixel wise with cross entropy loss based on how hard or easy some of the examples are. So when it comes to semantic segmentation, for example, this one, you may have a lot of pictures where you have a few people in them and a lot of like vegetation, right? So your, your picture data set might have a lot of vegetation in them and not, not a lot of people. And you want to basically create some kind of same seg model that like detects people like in jungles, right? So if you're, if you're installing cameras in, in jungles and in jungles, you have a lot of greenery, not a lot of people in them, right? So you have something called the class imbalance. Um, it happens a lot as well in medical imagery when in x-ray scans, you have a lot of like noise or you have a lot of classes that are basically related to like the bones and not a lot to like cancer tissues. So you have some kind of class imbalance in your, uh, in your data set. In a more understandable fashion or an example would be you have a lot of pictures of jungles and not a lot of people in them, but you want to be able to segment vegetation and people. But because you don't have a lot of people in them, your classes are imbalanced. You have a lot of vegetation classes and you don't have a lot of people classes. So what you do is you use something like a focal loss, which basically what it does is that it's a loss function that looks at which examples are easy examples, which of those images have a lot of people in them and makes it easy for the neural network to detect where people are and which images have like very small people in them. Like maybe the people are standing in the, behind the trees or like in the bushes. It just very makes them very hard for the neural network to predict where the people are. And it gives a lot of reward for the network to predict on the easy examples. And it basically, if the network doesn't predict on the hard examples, it doesn't like penalize the network too much if that hard example is too hard to predict on. So it tries to, ident it tries to like um, basically uh, reward the network or like balance the, the penalization of the network based on the imbalance of the classes. So if the blast classes are a bit imbalanced, it makes it hard to predict uh, some of the classes. It doesn't penalize the network too much if some of the examples are hard and it mostly focuses towards the easy examples. So that it helps the network uh, basically learn on the easy examples. A more intuitive example of this would be, for example, let's say a student is studying for exams for a maths exam and uh, because it's very hard to learn their calculus and integration, uh, like integration lessons, you kind of reward them by teaching them more on the uh, like easier examples, like just like easier equations and normal equations, with the hope that like they get motivated to learn the more complex examples. This is what you're doing here. You're 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 basically motivating the network to learn the easy examples for now, and then like gradually maybe it learns the harder examples that it learns more patterns from the easier examples. Very interesting. So that's another tactic you can do. And then the last one we have is dice loss. So that's another loss function that you use is basically is something similar to intersection of union. Um, so in object detection class, we talked about intersection of union and that's basically a metric that you use how your bounding boxes of your objects overlaps with the ground truth bounding boxes. In here, what you do is you use a dice loss, which is basically how many of your prediction pixels for that specific class overlap with your ground truth pixels and um, basically use this dice. It's like you dice the picture, basically. Uh, you use this dice function to figure out um, what that is. And the reason you multiply the number two is because um, at the bottom, you're doing your actually adding up the total prediction and ground, ground truth area. And you're basically double counting at the, at the denominator. So you need to double count at the top as well. You need to basically multiply the number at the top as well. If they're both overlapping, you get a number one. If they're not overlapping, then uh, yeah, then you basically have a dice coefficient. Um, so what you wanna do is you want to make sure that your prediction is overlapping your um, your total area. So the dice coefficient of one is perfect, the dice coefficient of zero, it's, uh, it's not good at all. It basically means you're not overlapping. So you can use this as well as a, as a way to make sure that you calculate the dice um, loss. So 
that kind of concludes our class for today. Um, we kind of reviewed uh, lots of different architectures. Uh, we reviewed um, how convolutional neural networks work. We reviewed uh, different architectures and the main concepts around semantic segmentation, which is just basically around encoding, decoding, making sure that you are keeping the localization context as well as the global context when you decode, as well as um, lots of different loss functions that you can use and how this loss functions work in terms of like helping you train your neural network to perform better semantic segmentation model. So um, that's the third workshop done. Um, or the fourth, so actually fifth workshop done in our series of workshops on deep learning and com cloud computing series. In the next workshop, we will focus on style transfer and how style transfer neural networks work in order to perform a style transfer on an image from a painting. Uh, so you learn the paint, so the neural network learns the style from a painting and then it learns the, the patterns in an image and it combines them together into a, like a painting of a person. And in the next workshop, we're actually going to do some coding. So I will actually have some kind of repo ready for you that you can actually play around with. Um, but I hope this workshop was useful for you. And I hope you actually learned quite a lot about like how semantic segmentation tasks work. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to re reach out to me. Um, I'm available on LinkedIn. Um, I hope this workshop was very useful for you. And um, if you would be interested um, at the end of this, workshop, what we will do is I will show you a repo where you could play around with the deep lab model to see if you can actually make it work with a city landscapes data set. So thank you very much, everyone. That's the end of today's workshop. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it quite well. I will keep in touch with you with future workshops uh, through uh, the mailing list. So if you have signed up through Eventbrite, you will go on the mailing list. Um, if you want to be contacted, I will send you the details. Uh, for those of you who want to um, play around with the code on Colab, uh, if you Google DeepLab, uh, there is a GitHub repo, uh, which is uh, DeepLab, this one. Um, so if you go to this link that I will share with you on the chat, this has the deep lab TensorFlow library for deep labeling. So deep labeling is basically the whole set of processes around semantic segmentation, uh, instance segmentation and panoptic segmentation. You can even do depth estimation and video panoptic segmentation. So by video panoptic segmentation, I mean this, this is a video panoptic segmentation. So that's exactly what self-driving cars use to perform uh, like to see what the what the objects around them are, and if you go here, there is a demo, and which is basically a Jupyter notebook that you can run in Colab, and then if you just go through this, um, you would be able to actually play around with a deep lab that has been trained on a city landscapes data set, and in order to get the data set themselves, you can basically there is an installation instructions here on how you can prepare the data set and. Uh, how you can prepare this repo. But basically the Cityscape data set is a data set of uh, images uh, that looks like this. So it's a lot of images of city, um, basically people like pictures of the city with people in them and cars in them and the, the roads. And it's been semantically segmented and it's all ready for you. So I think one of the things you could do is figure out how to like actually download this, and uh, prepare them and actually train your own neural networks on semantic segmentation. But there's also a lot of more data sets. So if you go back to the repo, you will see uh, there's lots of more data sets. There's Coco data set, KT step data set, Motor challenge data set, and so on. And there's also an instruction on how you can actually convert your own data sets of images into a semantic segmentation labeled or yeah, semantically segmented labeled data set that you can actually use to train your own neural network. So for example, maybe you wanna train a neural network to identify detect um, like iPhones in CCTV cameras or something. So you can actually use this as well. Um, so if there, um, I will have a play with it as well. 
and I may make it into a workshop. So if I do, I will let you know, and um, I will post it on the chat. Hopefully our future workshops, we can run it in Microsoft Reactor and we can actually meet in person. You can come to me and ask questions. But yeah, if you have more questions as well, we can have a quick five minute Q and A um, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions as well. Um, so this is the end of the workshop. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And then, yeah, I will stay for a few minutes and answer any questions you have. It will be part of the recording as well. So if you have to jump now, feel free to jump. Uh, the questions and the answers will be as well a part of this recording and I will put them on the website. So the first question, uh, so let me go back to the deep lab so people can see where, what and read it. So we have a few questions coming in. Uh, so the first question is from Justin. It says, do you have a recording of the previous workshops of today's as well? Uh, yeah, so the, the workshops are on YouTube. So I will upload this workshop on YouTube as well. So this is under the Beginners Machine Learning channel. Uh, feel free to subscribe. I will post the link in the chat. All right. Um, the next question is, I have a more specific question on the subject. I have a project at the moment on MATLAB where we are talking about introducing a number of medical images, which I have labeled slash segmented manually to a pre-trained AlexNet VGG 1619 network. My goal, my goal is to learn to recognize the label on my images. In your opinion, how many images should I introduce as an entry of, to my model, knowing that I also intend to use data augmentation afterwards? So if you can use data augmentation, um, which I would recommend if you don't have a lot of images, um, you may need may minimum maybe 500 to 1,000 images, I would recommend. If you can increase that to 3,000, 5,000, even 10,000, that would be way better. So the problem with not having a lot of images and having to use data augmentation is that there is, there is a chance that your model overfits to the data. So what that means is that if there is new examples that your model has not seen, um, your, your network is not going to perform well. So it's going to perform really bad on new examples, but it's going to perform really well on the training examples. So it is not going to perform well on real world examples. So what you want to do is you want to have as many examples as you can put together, but to get started with, start with 500 to 1000 examples and try to implement lots of data augmentation on top. Try it without and with and see how data augmentation improves the performance. It may not improve performance, it depends on what kind of data augmentation you do and what your data set is. So it's a more of a trial and error and play around with the architecture as well. Uh, so I said, I think you said you used a pre-trained AlexNet VGG 16. So maybe try it with DeepLab as well and see if that works. So we have to play around with the architectures play around with the, uh, with the hyperparameters of your architecture, for example, how many layers you use, what feature extractor you use and things like that. And whether your pre-trained feature extractor is a VGG 16 or is it something else? Um, and then yeah, play around with the deep lab uh, as well. And I think in, in the deep lab repo, you might have some um, instructions on how you can do transfer learning on the pre-trained deep lab model. So I would, I would recommend doing that. Any other questions? Can wait a few more minutes. Um, so we, we were supposed to have two hours. I think we finished 10 minutes early, which is always good. Uh, previously, all that I would normally I would put too much into the, these workshops in terms of content, and then we would overrun. But we have more minutes left. Um, we can wait a few more minutes. If not, um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to do today's workshop, and I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I'll look forward to meeting you in future workshops. Thank you very much.